Let's talk about the late woodland in the southeast, the period of time from about AD 500 to 1000. One huge difference between late woodland and middle woodland is the decline of the Hopewell interaction sphere. We see a lot less trade between the Midwest and the Southeast. Instead, we see highly variable regional cultures developing in the Southeast. We see population growth leading to many small communities across the landscape. In some places, we see less mound building, and in others, we see first time mound centers that were also population centers. One late woodland innovation was the bow and arrow for hunting, as evidenced by making smaller points, such as these small triangular points. At the beginning of late woodland, maize was rarely present, and when it was, it was obviously not part of the regular diet. But by the end of the late woodland, maize becomes a part of the diet. It was added to the longtime diet of Eastern agricultural complex crops, rather than replacing anything. We'll cover a few late woodland areas in the southeast. The lower Mississippi Valley, where we've already talked about the Marksville culture from the middle woodland period. Plum Bayou in Arkansas, just north of the lower Mississippi Valley. The Carolinas and the Whedon Island culture along the Gulf Coast, which arose out of the middle woodland Swift Creek. In the lower Mississippi Valley, which stretches from the mouth of the Arkansas River to the coast, late woodland arose out of Marksville culture. People's diet consisted of hunting wild animals, fishing, gathering wild nuts and fruits, but they were also growing the crops of the Eastern agricultural complex in addition to squash. We divide late woodland in this area into two periods, the early Baytown period over here from AD 500 to 750 and the later Coles Creek period AD 750 to 1200. Late woodland in the lower Mississippi Valley is marked by new ceramic practices. For one, we see a many more different vessel forms used, including bowls, as you see on the left, jars, as you see on the right, effigy vessels, and beakers. The paste is harder than earlier. In other words, the pottery is better made. We see a number of different surface treatments, but one of the most distinguishing characteristics is the rectilinear incising and all over body decoration. I couldn't resist showing you this picture. For a long time, one of my favorite pottery names has been Lulu Linear Punctated, and here is what it looked like. That name just tickles my fancy. Artifacts are made mostly from local materials, and exotic artifacts, that is non-local artifacts or materials, are rare. But we do find evidence for trade within the local region. People were building vacant ceremonial mound centers, and villages were located a mile or more away from these mound centers. Some bodies were buried in mounds. These had no grave goods, no materials placed in the grave with them, but others were buried in the villages. At some sites, we find three to nine mounds around a central plaza. We also find platform mounds with structures on top. Through time, mounds grew larger, usually in length and width, and not necessarily in height. So during Coles Creek, the egalitarian society transformed into a complex stratified society with a small number of elites. We also see a shift toward the end toward more reliance on maize. This period began with unranked egalitarian lineages, and by AD 1000, we see a centralization of power to a small elite group, ranked lineages, and ranking of communities. Changes in mound center organization and use indicate that the power moved from kin groups to a small number of people. Huge social changes going on during this time period. 
And our evidence is not in how people were treated in death. Oftentimes, archaeologists look to graves, grave location, grave goods to talk about social organization, but we don't see differential mortuary treatment and we don't see status goods buried with people. Instead, our evidence comes from the ranking of communities. We begin to see a hierarchy of communities, some settlements with no mounds, settlements with one to two mounds, development of civic ceremonial centers with central plazas and mound locations, often aligning with the sun solstice and the construction of multi-stage platform mounds that supported residences of the elite. Perhaps the most famous site was Troyville in northeastern Louisiana at the confluence of the Tensas, Wichita, and Little Rivers. 400 acres were enclosed by an embankment and there were at least 13 mounds, one of which was quite tall. Most of the site was destroyed historically. Let's turn now to the Plum Bayou culture, AD 600 to 1000, coeval with Coles Creek and located just to the north. The largest mound center, Toltec, is in central Arkansas. People hunted, eating things like deer, turkey, turtle. They fished, they gathered wild nuts, wild fruits, and they also farmed. They grew the Eastern agricultural complex as well as squash, gourd, and maybe a little bit of maize. The pottery was grog tempered. That is, they broke up older pots, ground them up and put those pieces into their paste to help form their pottery. And toward the end, a little bit of tempering with shell. The shapes included deep jars, short flaring rims on those jars, bowls of various shapes and sizes. And decorations were rare, but when they were present, they were often incised, punctated or red painted. At the Toltec site, we find at least 18 mounds surrounded by a 10 foot high, mile long embankment and ditch coming off of an old channel of the Arkansas River. Many of these mounds were platform mounds with structures on top, and they were arranged around two rectangular plazas. Here's one plaza highlighted in a lighter color, and here's another plaza over here. Mound C was the only burial mound. Within this, we find several alignments to solstice and equinox sunrise sunset, and it appears they were using a standardized unit of measure, 155.8 feet. The highest mound was 49 feet high. Another was 39 feet high, but most of the mounds were under four feet in height, and not all of them were in use at the same time. Only religious people stayed at Toltec. People lived in villages and they came here to participate in rituals. So small villages were located both in the floodplains and the uplands. A few of these villages had single mounds. People also lived in single household farmsteads adjacent to water. So a variety of places where you might live. Let's turn now to the Carolinas from AD 500 to 1000. Here, the late woodland tradition arose out of the middle woodland Deptford. People continued to build sand burial mounds as they had before. Really, we don't know much about late woodland in South Carolina. It's a, kind of a black hole in archeology, span the late woodland period. In North Carolina, late woodland along the coast dates all the way up to 1600. In other words, no Mississippian developed here. Although Mississippian did develop in the Appalachian summit and the lower Piedmont of North Carolina. So in North Carolina, the late woodland folk remained egalitarian all the way up to European contact. Settlements started as small dispersed households along the water, but through time we see a trend to compact palisaded villages especially after AD 800. The diet became an equal mix between the cultivation of Eastern agricultural complex 
as well as hunting, fishing, and gathering of wild nuts and fruits. We find maize after AD 100, but it doesn't really rise in, in importance until after AD 1000. And beans are also found at the end of that period. Along with the rise in maize, we find large underground storage pits and these large conical and conoidal storage vessels. Here the wall site, a Hillsboro phase late woodland North Carolina site, um, illustrates the complexity of these villages. Uh, you can see that houses were round in shape and that these uh, at this time period, AD 1450, these were palisaded villages. And it looks as though they either, here's a palisade line here, here's another one here. So the villages were either growing in size and as they stretched out, they put the palisade further out or they were shrinking, I'm not sure. Let's turn to the Whedon Island culture along the Gulf, Gulf Coastal Plain of Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. And it began somewhere between AD 300 and 600 and lasted up until AD 1000. Here we find sand burial mounds, either next to the village or not. And these sand burial mounds were used continuously, getting bigger through time. So villages either had a mound or they were near a mound but people also visited special purpose sites, such as for hunting or quarrying rock or digging up clay. The villages were located in the Mesic Forest, near water, near a variety of habitats, and usually within three to five kilometers or easy walking distance of a burial mound. Diet, they continued to hunt, fish, gather wild nuts and fruits, but they also grew the crops of gourd, sunflower, and sumpweed, and by the end, they also grew maize for food. One of the problems we face in talking about diet is that in northern Florida, where many of these sites occur, the sandy dirt does not preserve animal bone or plant remains very well. This culture is unusual because they continued the tradition of placing elaborate grave goods in the burial mounds. Here we see the first use of golf tradition pottery, which initially occurred with the Swift Creek stamped pottery and then overtook it. Among the Whedon Island peoples, we find two kinds of wares. At villages, we find utilitarian ware, which was either plain or complicated stamped, check stamped or simple stamped on the surface. But then we also find ceremonial pottery at the mounds. These could be decorated with incised lines, such as you see here, or red painting, and these were placed in the burial mounds. So the Whedon Island special mortuary pottery is very well made. It could be zoned and incised, as you see on the left. It was often ritually killed, as you see on the right. So this hole in the bottom of the vessel um, indicates to an archeologist that the pot was killed. This is a common phenomenon in cultures around the world that uh, when you put a, bot, a pot in, with a, uh, in a mortuary complex, you wouldn't put a living pot in, you would kill it by breaking out the bottom first. We find distinctive mortuary pot shapes, including cut out animals, double and triple bowls, animal and human effigy bowls, and animal and human rim effigies. The social system appears to have been a big man society, or like a tribe. So, through control of resources, one lineage becomes dominant in a community for a time, but then another village or lineage rises to power. Thus, like an egalitarian societies, leadership was achieved and still not inherited. We see variation in the social structure by region but we see an elaborate set of religious beliefs involving mound raising, ceremony, and ritual. One of the largest Whedon Island civic ceremonial centers was Kolomoki in Southwest Georgia. 
Here, a horseshoe-shaped village enclosed four mounds, and four more mounds were found outside the village. It's thought that there was anywhere from 500 to 2,000 residents. Mound A is a platform mound, quite large, 200 by 325 feet and 56 feet high. It was topped with a red clay cap over a white clay layer. To the south and north of Mound A were two small domed mounds, and across the plaza to the west were dome-shaped burial mounds and three other additional small platform mounds. The mounds appear to have had astronomical alignments. So mounds A, D, and E formed a line that marked the spring equinox, and mounds F and D lined up with the summer solstice. Mound D had four log and stone slab-lined burial tombs underneath the mortuary structure. This tomb was covered with four layers of colored clay. A high-status individual was buried along with other people. And in the uh, mound fill itself, a large cache of effigy, animal, and human pots were deposited on the east side of the mound during a mortuary ritual. Mounds D and E contained a total of 86 primary burials, along with 42 secondary burials, such as single skulls or cremations or bundle burials. In a bundle burial, um, after the body had rotted, you would gather up the bones and then bundle them together. Both had large caches of elaborate mortuary vessels placed again on the eastern side of the mound. Several people are believed to have been sacrificed. So all of these vessels are not with individuals, but on the side of the mound. The only grave goods were personal ornaments, such as shell beads and copper ear spools. Following this presentation, I recommend watching the second presentation on late woodland developments in the American Bottom area of West Central Illinois in the vicinity of Cahokia, which was the largest Mississippian mound center in North America.